right before we go into the outline, let us take some time to consider where we are. Because every person in the world is in one of these two places. Either he's under the law or he's in Christ. Now in Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 through 22, the Apostle Paul reviewed 2,000 years of Old Testament history from Abraham through Moses to Christ. He also showed us how these great biblical names are related to one another in the unfolding purpose of God, how God gave to Abraham a promise and to Moses a law, and how through Christ he fulfilled the promise which the law had revealed as indispensable. For the law condemned the sinner to death, while the promise offered him justification and eternal life. Now Paul elaborates. He's elaborating his theme, and he shows that this progression from the promise to the law to the fulfillment of the promise is more than the history of the Old Testament and of the Jewish nation. It is a biography of every man, that is, at least of every Christian man. Everybody, everybody is either held captive by the law because he's still awaiting the fulfillment of the promise, or he's delivered from the law because he has inherited the promise. More simply, everybody is living either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and derives his religion either from Moses or from Jesus. In the language of this paragraph, he is either under the law or in Christ. God's purpose for our spiritual pilgrimage is that we should pass through the law into the experience of the promise. The tragedy is that so many people separate, it, separate them by wanting one without the other. Some try to go to Jesus without first meeting Moses. They want to skip the Old Testament and inherit the promise of justification in Christ without the prior plan of condemnation by the law. Others go to Moses and the law to be condemned, but they stay in this unhappy bondage. They are still living in the Old Testament. Their religion is a grievous yoke, hard to be born. They have never gone to Christ to be set free. Both these stages are depicted in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 through verse 29. Now verse 23 and 24 are going to describe what we were under the law. And verse 25 through 29 will describe what we are in Christ. Now let's ask the question, uh, what were we under the law? Just look at verse 23 and 24 before we begin to outline. Well, in a word, we were in bondage. And the Apostle Paul is going to use two similes in verse 23 and 24 in which the law is likened first to a prison in which we are held captive and then he's going to liken it to us having a schoolmaster or a tutor that we might come to Christ. Now we'll say some more about these things in just a few minutes. But right now let us go to the outline and talk about uh, the first point of the outline. Remember now there are four points. And the first point is faith in Christ was before the law. And we're going to have two pictures of the law, verse 23, 24, and 25. Now let's read it again. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. I'm sorry, I'm reading in chapter 4. Let me get to chapter 3. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. That's verse 23 of chapter 3. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, certainly we could have broken these verses down, verse 23 and 24, and talked about the things under the law, but... The thing I want to stress is faith in Christ was before the law. And look at two pictures of the law. Because there are two pictures which clearly illustrate the purpose of the law. And the first picture is the law was a prison for man. Before faith came, that is, before Christ died, 
man was kept under the law. The word for kept under means to be guarded, kept in custody, custody, imprisoned, held in bondage. Very simply, the law shuts man up under sin. It imprisons and holds man in bondage to sin. How? Well, at least three ways. One, the law shows man exactly where he fails, exactly where he comes short. There's no question about it. The law said to do this, but the man did that. He failed or disobeyed. The failure is clearly spelled out, just as clearly as the speed limit sign spells out the violation of the speeder. The law, secondly, accuses and condemns man. As soon as a person violates the law, the law, the law charges him. The law is in black and white, written down, so there's no question about its having been broken. Therefore, it preys upon his mind, cuts and convicts his heart. Guilt and conviction take over. And the man is troubled and vexed to varying degrees, all dependent on the seriousness of the violation. And thirdly, the law has no life and no power to deliver man from the punishment due him for his violation. This is the whole point. The law reveals the violation and condemns man. It imprisons man. The law does not deliver man. It condemns man to bondage. It continues and continues to point out man's sin and his failure. And the case the law is endless. Its finger of accusation points out the man's failure every time he violates. The bondage to the law is ongoing. Therefore, the only hope for man is for someone to appear on the scene with the power to release him from prison. And that someone has appeared. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, has come to set us free. But notice something. As prisoners, we have to accept his deliverance. The choice is ours. We can believe and trust his power to deliver us from prison, or we cannot believe it and stay in prison. Now, what we were under the law, well... We were in prison, and uh, we were held in custody. And where it talks about uh, we were uh, kept under the law, it simply means like being protected by military guards, or like a city was guarded by a regiment of troops, and uh, they watched the gates day and night, not letting anybody escape from the city. I mean, once you get under the law, though, you'll see you can't live up to it. You'll see you can't keep every single law every single time, every time. And so that's one way Paul looked at it. And then there's a second way Paul looked at it. The law was a schoolmaster or a guardian for that man. The law was man's guardian to lead him to see his need for Christ. He was usually a trusted slave who was in charge of a child's moral welfare. But he had one particular duty to which Paul was referring. Every day the guardian took the child to school and delivered him to the teacher. And then at the end of the day he returned for the child and brought him back home safely. This was what the law was to do. The law was to lead man to Christ, the true teacher of faith. The law does this by showing man that he's utterly unable to secure righteousness by himself. He must look to Christ, the real teacher, for righteousness and acceptance by God, that is, for justification by faith. And once Christ, faith in Him, has come, there's no need for the Lord nor for any other guardian. For Jesus Christ brings us face to face with God. I can't put it any simpler than that. And so we're either in the Old Testament under the law or we're in the New Testament in Christ. Now, preachers stress that to your people when you teach in the book of Galatians or when you talk about asking them if they want to stay in bondage. Ask them, do they live in the Old Testament? Or ask them, do they live in the New Testament? If they live in the Old Testament, they're under the law. If they live in the New Testament, they're in Christ. Once they place faith in Christ. So the law is a prison for man. Can anyone successfully escape from this prison? Why do men think they can escape on their own? The only escape is Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, does the law have any power to deliver its prisoners? Where does your hope of deliverance come from? Where does your faith come in? In what practical ways does God use the law to bring us to Christ? Answer those questions. 
And then you'll see what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. All right, the second point of the outline. Faith makes us children of God. Verse 26 and 27. For we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, how do we know that we're justified by faith instead of by the law and by doing the best we can? Because faith makes us children of God. As stated in the previous point, Jesus Christ brings us face to face with God. He stirs God to adopt us as children of God. How? By faith. Note two critical and crucial points. First of all, faith causes us to focus upon God's Son, Jesus Christ. Man can rest upon one thing. God will accept anyone who focuses upon His Son, Jesus Christ, for God loves His Son to the ultimate degree. God is no less than any normal father who loves his son. In fact, God is much more man, much more than man. He is perfect. Therefore, God loves his son, Jesus Christ, with a perfect love. This simply means that God will honor any person who honors his son by believing and trusting him. If a person believes in Jesus Christ for righteousness, then God will honor that man by counting him righteous. The point is this. The person who tries to become acceptable to God by the law and by doing the best he can, the man who focuses upon the law and good works, keeps his mind upon the law and struggles to be good. God is not the center and focus of his thoughts in life, the law and his works are. But the person who has faith in Jesus Christ focuses upon Christ. He honors God's Son. Therefore, God accepts his faith, the focus of his life, as righteousness. The person becomes acceptable to God. God actually accepts the person as a child of His. How is this possible? The answer is the subject of the next point. And that's point two. Faith clothes us with Christ, with His righteousness and sonship. This is the most wonderful truth, for it tells us that we can actually put on Christ, a glorious revelation. The phrase put on is the picture of putting on clothes and uh, of covering oneself. All that Christ is can cover us. Christ is two things that hold great significance for us. First of all, Christ is the very embodiment of righteousness. He is the Son of God who came to earth to secure righteousness for us. He lived a sinless and perfect life. He always obeyed God, never violated the law or will of God, not even one single time. Therefore, He was the perfect ideal man. He was the pattern of what every man should be. As the ideal and perfect pattern, he could represent all men. And this is exactly what happened. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. When we believe in him, God clothes us with Christ, with his righteousness. And because we're clothed with righteousness of Christ, God sees us in his Son and accepts us. Picture this illustration. Let your left hand represent Christ, and your right index finger represents you. Now wrap your left hand around your index finger. What do you see? You see Christ, not yourself. For Christ is covering you. And so it is with faith. When you believe in Jesus Christ, your faith covers you with Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For He made Him sin to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. Now what's the Bible saying? God made Jesus Christ to be sin for me and you, even though he had never committed a sin. Why did he do that? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took our unrighteousness. It was placed in his body on the cross of Calvary. He offered his soul for an offering. And uh, because he took our unrighteousness and because he was righteous, then we were made righteous in Him. All right, there's a second thing. Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, to be clothed with Christ means that we're covered with His Sonship. When God looks at the believer, He sees the Son, Jesus Christ, covering Him. Therefore, He counts the believer as a son of His. This is the way we become children of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son. When we believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son, God takes our faith and places us in Christ, and to be in Christ is to be in the sonship of Christ. God actually sees us in Jesus Christ, in His Son. Therefore, He accepts us as children of His. 
All because our faith has covered up us with Christ. Jesus said in John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. How much do you value your relationship as a child of God? Sometimes we might be tempted to doubt God's, God's love. We fail time and again and come up so short. Some of us even commit terrible sin. We wonder, how could God forgive me? How could He love me after I fail so much and so terribly? Jim Adams shares his eye-opening story with us, and I quote, Perhaps no composer has ever captured the musical heart and souls of America as did Irving Berlin. In addition to his familiar favorites such as God Bless America and Easter Parade, he wrote, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, which still ranks as the all-time best-selling musical score. In an interview for the San Diego Union newspaper, Don Freeman asked Irving Berlin, Is there any question you've never been asked that you would like someone to ask you? Well, yes, there is one, Berlin replied. What do you think of the many songs you've written that didn't become his? My reply would be that I still think they're wonderful. Now, God, too, has an unshakable delight in what and whom he has made. He thinks each of his children is wonderful. And whether they're hit in the eyes of others or not, God will always think they're wonderful. So, what is the person's relationship to God before you say? Well, we know he's under the law. He's in prison. The law is trying to be a schoolmaster to bring him to Christ. Can you be a child of God without having faith in Christ? Absolutely not. Why does God accept you? Only by faith when he adopts us. Because Jesus Christ became righteousness for us. What good works have you done that convinced God to adopt you into his family? And we know the answer, absolutely none. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his grace, by his mercy are we saved. And so what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, and the liberal tries to say everybody's going to heaven, and he uses this verse to do it, he says, for you're all the children of God, and he stops right there. But the rest of the verse says, by faith in Christ Jesus. And so when, when you place your faith in Christ Jesus, verse 25 says, after you place that faith in Christ, you are no longer under a schoolmaster. You are no longer under the law. And then verse 27 says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, Christ covers you. It's like a suit of clothes you put on. Christ covers you. But I want to look at this word baptism and note the reference to baptism instead of belief. The Bible says, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now why did Paul switch from using the word believe to the word baptism? Why did he not say, For as many as you as have believed in Christ, have put on Christ? Now, he's told us all through this epistle that you cannot be circumcised and be saved. It's not required. Now, let me say that again. I better phrase that different. Surely a man can be circumcised, but he can't count on that for salvation. Now, those people in Galatia were teaching, yes, accept Christ and be circumcised and be baptized, so on and so forth. So the crux of the message is uh, you have to place faith in Christ to be saved, so he's certainly not coming back here and saying you've got to be baptized to be saved. You see, when you put on Christ, when you're in Christ, over here in uh, verse 26, by faith in Christ Jesus, when you're in Christ, that's the inward thing that you're to do once you accept faith. That's what God gives you. He puts Christ in you. And the outward sign would be baptism. And so let's look at it. Is Paul said that a person is saved by baptism? Any thinking and honest person knows there are thousands and thousands of people who have been baptized, and yet they live like the devil himself. Therefore, Paul could not mean that it is baptism that causes God to clothe a person with Christ. And similarly, any honest and thinking person knows that there are thousands and thousands of people who profess faith and yet live like the devil himself. Therefore, Paul could not mean what the general public means by faith. Now, I know that sounds pretty strong. And uh, I want to go into it just a little bit. What Paul is saying is what Scripture declares. A true believer 
is baptized with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The believer lives for Christ. And as he lives for Christ, it includes the ordinance of being baptized. For baptism pictures his faith. Baptism is the evidence of faith. And so what I'm saying to you is, when he's in Christ, that's inwardly. Christ is in him. And outwardly, he displays that, the true believer does, by being baptized. Now, I know a lot of people claim to be saved that are not saved. I know a lot of people being baptized that are still not saved. I understand that. But I'm talking about what the true believer does. All right? Why do some people then think baptism saves them? What does the Scripture say? Well, right in the context of these Scriptures, the Bible says, For you are all the children of God by baptism. No. For you are all the children of God. I'm reading verse 26. In chapter 3, by going to church? No. For you all the children of God by doing good works? Absolutely not. For you all the children of God by singing in the choir? No. For you all the children of God by preaching in the pulpit? No. What does it say? For you all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, let's take the third point of the outline. Faith in Christ makes us one. It eliminates all distinctions and prejudices. Verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now how do we know we're justified by faith rather than by the law and by doing the best we can? Because faith in Christ Jesus makes us one. And that eliminates all distinctions and prejudices. The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. Now this is a startling truth. Jesus Christ is the answer to all the prejudice, bitterness, hatred, oppression, and inequalities of the world. How can he solve the divisions among men? Note that phenomenal statement. You're all one in Christ Jesus, that is every believer. What is there about Jesus Christ that makes us one? Well, first of all, every believer stands up on an equal footing before Jesus Christ, the footing of faith. No person is accepted for any reason other than faith. All persons who come to Jesus Christ come because they're ever so short of Christ, they're ever so different from Christ, they are ever so imperfect. Yet Jesus Christ accepts all people who come to him by faith. John 6, 37, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast down. Jesus Christ reaches out to embrace all believers despite their being so much less and so different from Him. Therefore, when we look at other, another believer who differs from us, we do just what Jesus Christ did for us. We love, accept, embrace that believer. Differences do not matter. All that matters is love, acceptance, and brotherhood in Christ. Now, I know that's going to bother some people, but that's what the Bible says. Secondly, every true believer loves and stands in Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we look at another believer, we see in him Christ. We're not to see the believer, but to see Christ covering the believer. We're to pay no attention to his color, nationality, sex, social status, or any other differences. Differences just do not matter. All that matters is that we will all grow into the image of Christ, love and accept, and become more and more the brothers and sisters of God. Romans 10, 12. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now, so let's say it this way. There's no distinction of race. The Bible says that. There's neither Jew nor Greek. And uh, this includes nations of every race, color, and language. We're equal, equal in our need of salvation, equal in our inability to earn or deserve it, and equal in the fact that God offers us freely in Christ. And once we've received it, our equality is transformed into fellowship, the brotherhood which only Christ can create. So there's no distinction in race. Secondly, there's no distinction of rank. There's neither slave nor free. We're talking about rank now, R-A-N-K. Nearly every society in the history of the world has developed its class system. Circumstances of birth, wealth, privilege, and education have divided men and women from one another. But in Christ, snobbery is prohibited and class distinctions are rendered void. Thirdly, there's no distinction of sex. The Bible says there's neither male nor female. 
This remarkable assertion of the equality of the sexes was made centuries in advance of the times. Women were always despised in the ancient world, even in Judaism, and not infrequently exploited and ill-treated as well. But here the assertion is made that in Christ male and female are one and equal, and made by Paul, who is ignorantly supposed by many to have been an anti-feminist. Now a word of caution must be added. This great statement of verse 28 does not mean that racial, social, and sexual distinctions are actually ob ob liberated. Christians are literally are not literally colorblind, so they do not are, so they do not notice whether a person's skin or, or is black, brown, yellow, or white. Nor are they unaware of the cultural and educational background from which people come. Nor do they ignore a person's sex, treating a woman if she were a man or a man if she were a woman. Of course, every person belongs to a certain race and nation, has been nurtured in a particular culture, and, he's the, and, he, and he is either male or female. When we say that Christ has abolished these distinctions, we mean not they do not exist, but they do not matter. They're still there, but they no longer create any barriers to fellowship. We recognize each other as equals, brothers and sisters in Christ. By the grace of God, we will resist the temptation to despise one another or patronize one another, for we know ourselves to be all one person in Christ Jesus. Now wait. Does Paul have something to say about God's the head of Christ and Christ the head of man and man the head of woman? Absolutely, he sure does. That's for order. That's to avoid confusion. But it would take a person with less than good sense to think that a woman is not just as precious in Jesus Christ's sight that's saved as a man that's saved. They're all one in Christ Jesus. And by the way, men, before you begin to attack these women, women and make them second-class citizens, keep in mind Galatians tells us, had it not been for a woman, Christ would not have been brought into the world. Now, I know the seed of God made Christ, but he implanted it in the womb of a virgin, a woman, and brought Christ into the world. So then we could say, a woman was somewhat responsible for bringing sin into the world, even though Adam got credit for it, and a woman also brought Christ into the world, even though we know God brought him into the world. And so, we need to be careful with this. We need to simply say that as many as been baptized in Christ, have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ, and there's no distinctions. Chinese people that accepted Christ are just as much in Christ as American people that have accepted Christ. African people who've accepted Christ are just as much in Christ as the white race who've accepted Christ. There is no difference. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. You see, in Christ, we're going to learn this next verse, in Christ, we're Abraham's seed. If we walk with Christ, we will notice that petty things that divide us will fade away. How is this possible? Why, well, it's possible by the cross of Calvary. At the foot of the cross, all the ground is level. Listen to this humorous yet sad discussion between two brothers. Comedian M.O. Phillips tells this story this way, and I quote, In conversation with a person I recently met, he said, I asked, Are you a Protestant or Catholic? My new acquaintance replied, Protestant. I said, Me too. What franchise? He answered, Baptist. Me too, I said. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist, he replied. Me too, I shouted. We continued to go back and forth, and finally I asked, nor the conservative fundamental Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879, or nor the conservative fundamental Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He replied, nor the conservative fundamental Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die, you heretic, unquote. And that's the way it is in the world. I am not talking about the ecumenical movement. I'm not talking about bringing all different denominations together. I know you can't do that. That would be confusion. But I do believe this. I'm a Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist. I'm independent from the independents. I don't hang my hat with anybody but the Word of God. I fellowship with anybody who claims to be a child of God and demonstrates that in his life. 
But I believe the Presbyterians will be in heaven. Billy Sunday, certainly. I'm a Baptist, but I believe some Methodists will be in heaven. John Wesley and Charles Wesley, certainly. I'm a Baptist, but I believe, and I'm an independent Baptist, but I believe that uh, Charles Stanley, a Southern Baptist, will be in heaven. I believe that. I'm a Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist. And I believe that uh, the greatest... conservative scholar in the independent ranks as far as believing the Bible is the Word of God. Now, he might be twisted some of it to his own destruction, but I believe Peter Ruckman will die and go to heaven. Now, I know that offended some of the brethren. But why not I believe that? Why not I believe that Billy Sunday, Charles and John Wesley, Charles Stanley, and Peter Ruckman are all from different denominations. Why not I believe they'll be in heaven? Verse 26, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's why I believe it. You see, the Bible tells me to judge nothing before time. Leave that to God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. These men claim to be saved. I believe it. Their lifestyle reflects it. I didn't say they were perfect. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Now there's no condemnation to you. No condemnation. It doesn't say no imperfection. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say no sin. It doesn't say no foolishness. It doesn't say uh, no error. It says no condemnation. And so once a man places his faith in Christ Jesus, he's saved. And this is the way the thing goes. If they're not just what we want them to be, we think they're heretics. Too many churches and too many relationships are split over insignificant matters. In Christ, we're brothers and sisters. We must focus on our oneness in Christ, not on our differences. We have too many things which unite us with other Christian believers to let the petty things divide us from his body. I'm not endorsing the ecumenical movement to bring all denominations together. That would result in confusion. But I am saying this. People in a community who have like faith, who believe in Christ, they should cooperate with all believers to get the job done for Jesus Christ. And quit saying, well, they believe thus and so, and I don't believe thus and so, and they believe thus and so. Do they believe in Christ? I have a neighbor that's a Pentecostal. He says he has to get the tongues. I tell him, I think he's boasting of a false skill. I do that in love. He and I have had good friendship for ten years because he tells me from his own lips that he's trusted in the grace of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago to save his soul and nothing else. And friend, that's what I'm doing. Now, he says he has to give the tongues. I say he doesn't. He says he has Christ Jesus. I accept that. You see, I have some things that make me imperfect too. I teach things in the Bible that I think the Bible is saying, and later I find out I was wrong. And my prayer is my friend will later find out he's wrong. But I'll tell you this much. If I wanted somebody to pray for me, I wouldn't hesitate to ask that man to pray for me. Because he says he's a child of God. We need to tear down the fences. We must focus on our oneness in Christ. All right? Let's look at point four. Faith in Christ makes us ask the promise. Verse 29. And if you be in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, how do we know that we're justified by faith instead of by the law and by doing the best we can? Because faith in Christ makes us heirs of the promise. Remember the promise made to Abraham, the promise of God's blessings, of God's presence and leadership, of being accepted by God and given the privilege of living forever in the land of Canaan, the type and symbol of heaven, of the new heavens and earth. The point is this. Jesus Christ is the heir of Abraham. Therefore, if a person is in Christ, then he inherits the promises made to Abraham. He inherits the promise of God's acceptance of righteousness and of living forever in the new heavens and earth as a son of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified, also glorified together. 
now. That tells you that everybody that's put their faith in Christ Jesus, men, women, black people, white people, Chinese people, any people, uh, uh, slave man or free man, president or chauffeur, whatever it is, if they place their faith in Christ Jesus, they're clothed in Christ Jesus, they've been baptized in Christ Jesus, and they are Christ, and they are Abraham's seed, and we're heirs according to the promise. That includes all saved Catholics. You say, Brother Hayes, can a Catholic be saved? Absolutely so a Catholic can be saved, and many are. I read a story one time about a Catholic priest who said, if we could just get the world to understand that one ounce of blood of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary could save every man that's ever lived, he had it right. Was he right in other things? No, he was wrong in some areas. You know that as well as I do. But it'd be foolish to say that a man as a Catholic is not a Christian. Now, most of them may not be. Probably they're not. I don't know. It's not me to judge. I know there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I know they're wrong when they go through the Virgin Mary. I know they're wrong when they take the Lord's Supper and think it's Christ himself they're taking it. I know they're wrong when they confess their sins to a pope. You do that to Jesus Christ, and you don't go through the Virgin Mary to do it. I know they're wrong in those areas, but I also know they're right if they've accepted Jesus Christ individually as their personal Savior. Now, that's what I believe. Some of you want your money back, don't you? All I'm saying is this. Faith in Christ makes us heirs of the promise. According to Scripture, then, you tell me, according to Scripture, who is the heir of Abraham's promise? How does this inheritance apply to the Christian believer? What guarantees has God given to the Christian believer that makes his promises available today? I'm asking you that. Doesn't those few verses that I read to you, doesn't it say that if we have placed faith in Christ, Christ closes, and then no matter who we are, Woman or man, Jew or Greek, free or bond, we're all one in Christ. Yeah. But to get the job done down here on earth, to get the job done down here on earth, we have to stick to our beliefs. I believe Baptists are the closest to the Bible. Therefore, I'm a Baptist. But I love those Methodists who love the Bible and who honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I love those Presbyterians who honor the Bible and who loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've had a many a brethren to come to my school that was not of my denomination that loved the Bible and honored Christ. That's what I'm teaching. I'm teaching we need to look over some things, not get together like they did at the Tower of Babylon. That'd be confusion. But to stand for what we stand for and realize we're one in Jesus Christ. As you picture your life on a road map, are you on course trusting and living for God? Or have you focused your eyes on the things of the world? God is the supreme, all-knowing guide who will never lead you astray. Listen to these lyrics from the pen of Christian songwriter Michael Carr. To hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand that I cannot hold, to trust in a way that I cannot see, that's what faith must be. How do you lay hold on the benefits of Christ? Well, it takes faith. Remember, faith in Christ was before the law. Faith makes us children of God. Faith in Christ makes us one, eliminates all distinctions and prejudices. Faith in Christ makes us heirs of the promise. Now, the Bible teaches that God has set certain bounds for His people. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, and Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, I believe. And uh, people ask me often about interracial marriage, and I want to talk about that. I think that white people ought to marry white people. I think black people ought to marry black people, simply because it's healthy for the children they bring in the world, and because of the way society is. But, what the Bible is teaching is this. Don't marry anybody whose religion is different from yours. In other words, if you're a Christian, 
Don't marry a Buddhist. Don't marry someone who does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind. Don't do that. It'd be better to interracially marry than it would be to interreligionally marry. That's what I want you to understand. And so it's because of health reasons how a child will grow and prosper, how society would talk about him if he came from, mixed, from a mixed marriage, how he'd always be looked down on, generally speaking, by the world. So we need to get over some prejudices, and we need to get over distinctions and yet live within our own bounds and do what we can for Christ while we're here on this earth and then when we go to heaven certainly we'll all be one in Christ and certainly those barriers will be torn down and certainly those distinctions and prejudices would be eliminated otherwise it wouldn't be heaven and faith in Christ makes us heirs of that promise now we have, we have seen that in Christ we belong to God and to each other. And in Christ we also belong to Abraham. We take our place in the notable historical succession of faith, whose outstanding representatives are listed in Hebrews chapter 11. No longer do we feel ourselves to be strays without any significance in history or bits of useless uh, drifting wood on the tide of time. Instead, we find our place in the unfolding purpose of God. We're the spiritual seed of our father Abraham, who lived and died 4,000 years ago. For in Christ we have become heirs of the promise which God made to him. These then are the results of being in Christ. And they speak with powerful revelance to us today. For our generation is busy developing a philosophy of meaninglessness. It is fashionable nowadays to believe, or to say that you believe, that life has no meaning, no purpose. There are many who admit they have nothing to live for. They do not feel like they belong anywhere. Or if they belong, it is to the group known as the unattached. They class themselves as outsiders or misfits. They are without anchor, security, or home. In biblical language, they are lost. To such people comes the promise that in Christ we find ourselves. The unattached become attached. They find their place in eternity. Related first and foremost to God and his, as his sons and daughters in society. Related to each other as brothers and sisters in the, name, in the same family. And in history. Related also to the succession of God's people down the ages. This is a three-dimensional attachment which we gain when we're in Christ. In height, breadth, and length. It is an attachment in height through reconciliation to God who although radical theologians repudiate the concept that we must be careful how we interpret it, it is God above us transcendent over the universe that he's made. Next, it is an attachment in breath since in Christ we are united to all believers throughout the world. Thirdly, it is an attachment in length as we join the long, long line of believers throughout the whole course of time. So conversion, although supernatural in its origin, is natural in its effects. It does not disrupt nature, but fulfills it. For it puts me where I belong. It relates me to God, to man, and to history. It enables me to answer the most basic of all human questions. Who am I? And to say, in Christ I am a son of God. In Christ I am united to all the redeemed people of God, past, present, and future. In Christ I discover my identity. In Christ I find my feet. In Christ I stand. In Christ I come home. We cannot come to Christ to be justified until we've first been to Moses to be condemned. But once we've gone to Moses and acknowledged our sin, guilt, and condemnation, we must not stay there. We must let, we must let Moses, the great lawgiver, send us to Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind. Please turn the cassette over and start at the beginning on the other side.